Uh, and she was to introduce me. So for those of you that don't know me, yeah, I'm Max Payne. Uh, a substantial part of my skin. practice is oil and gas. I practice in oil food. Uh, and my presentation today is on oil and gas leasing. And then at the end, we'll go, uh, and I'll go over conditions in oil and gas leasing. Uh, not all of them, but some of the standard ones that are negotiated. Uh, that you run into a, a situation where you're negotiating an oil and gas lease, I can give you some background. What to expect more. and what the common terms Good presentation. are. Uh, and then we'll uh, also talk about surface use agreements, uh, what they are, and why uh, they're a good idea. My outline is after the tab uh, in the book, and then after my outline is a fairly uh, standard oil and gas lease. There really isn't any such thing, but this, that lease that's in the book is about as close as you'll get. And then after that oil and gas lease is the uh, copy of my PowerPoint slides, uh, which follow my outline. The, uh, there's way more terms on, of an oil and gas lease are negotiated now than ever used to be. I would say 20 years ago, when someone, a rancher, was offered an oil and gas lease, it was pretty much taken or leave it. There was going to be a one-eighth royalty, a ten-year primary term, and the bonus was maybe five bucks. Uh, and there really wasn't much negotiation. That's not true now. Uh, many terms are negotiated, and many terms other than just those three. And there is no, uh, there's no right royalty, there is no right bonus, and there is no right primary term. As I, as I say, uh, I don't know if you can see that, but I say all items vary, in all terms vary according to timing and location. And, and that's true in South Dakota, even when we're not in the heart of a big play like the Bakken. Uh, royalties, bonuses and primary terms, which is the initial term of an oil and gas lease, very wide, even within a couple of miles in Harding County. Uh, someone will say that they got a 15% royalty, and two miles away, a guy couldn't get more than a one-eighth royalty. And it doesn't mean that the, the guy who got the one-eighth royalty didn't do a good job of negotiating. It just can vary that much. Oil companies will set the parameters that they will pay or agree to uh, according to the area and according to, look, uh, according to the time. As they get closer to the end of when they get leases gathered up, they may either get easier to negotiate with or harder to negotiate with. The three most important terms of an oil and gas lease and the three most negotiated terms are the amount of the bonus, the amount of the royalty, and the length of the lease, the length of the primary term. We'll talk about primary term and secondary term uh, a little bit, but the primary term is the initial term of the lease. It's how long it's good for after the bonus is paid. And there, we'll talk about other terms in the lease too, but we'll start with those three. The bonus is the consideration that's paid for the lease. It's, uh, I don't know for sure why it's called a bonus. It's just the payment for the lease, but I suspect it's because it's what's paid in addition or a bonus on top of what will be paid as a royalty should there be production. Uh, the bonus is paid calculated per net mineral acre. And what that means is if you're a rancher and you own a thousand acres and you have an undivided one-half mineral interest, then you have 500 net mineral acres. And if the bonus is $10 an acre, you will get $5,000. The bonus will not be stated in the lease. It won't be stated in total, or it will, and it won't be stated on a per net mineral acre basis. We'll go through a lease 
lease here in a little bit, and I'll show you what, what the lease will say. But I have never seen a lease that states what the bonus is. Uh, historic payment procedure. Not many years ago, it used to be that uh, if a oil company would come out to see the rancher and negotiate the terms of the lease, the rancher would sign the lease and the oil company would give the rancher a 30 or a 45 day site graph that would be payable upon approval of title or about on the oil company clearing title. So say the oil company would do the title examination, clear title, and then it would, it would pay the site graph. And when the rancher deposited that site graph with the bank, and it processes when the oil company sees it, that's how come it has the name site graph, it then had 30 to 45 days to pay it. Still, it had to approve title also, but once it approved title, it had 30 to 45 days to pay the site graph. Ranchers and many people thought, well, that's the same as a, as a check. You know, it's good. Once I deposit it, it's my money. And that's not, not true. Uh, there could be instances where the oil company wouldn't pay the site graft and, and people spent the money. So they spent money they didn't have. The, the current payment procedure that I see is the oil company will negotiate the lease, the oil company and the ranch will negotiate the lease. They will give, they will take a take the signed lease with them, then check title, approve title, and then pay the rancher with a check. That is good. It's good when it's deposited. So it's still payment is conditioned upon approving title, but the site graphs are no longer used, which I think is a better procedure. Something that, that I think is that needs to be pointed out is when a rancher signs an oil and gas lease, and only the rancher signs it, the oil company doesn't sign it, there's no contract. A contract only comes into play when the oil company pays the bonus. Then there's a contract. So if the rancher sitting at the kitchen table signs the lease, thinking that he now has a lease with this oil company, he's mistaken. That's only an offer, and there is no contract until the oil company pays. And the reason for that is they're going to approve title. They have to check title. The rancher may end up not owning any mineral interest. In that case, the oil company is not going to pay. It, it sometimes makes a rancher uh, or a lawyer for a rancher nervous when the oil company has the rancher sign a lease, and then and the oil company takes the lease with them, and then they go check title. The concern is, what if the oil company records the lease and, and says it has a lease and it hasn't paid? Well, number one, that's fraud. Uh, and number two, we have a statutory provisions, which I've cited there, which make it fairly easy for the rancher to cure that situation. Uh, you can record an affidavit saying that lease is no good. I have never seen an oil company take a lease and record it when they haven't paid the bonus. I, I mean, an oil company might try that once. Uh, I've never seen it, but that's all they get away with it. Okay, the second term, remember I said it's bonus royalty and primary term. The second of those three important terms is the royalty. Uh, historically, the royalty was always one eighth, twelve and a half percent. Oil companies would not budge off of that. Uh, now, there are higher royalties being agreed to and paid by the oil companies uh, in South Dakota. Uh, Maybe you could get a 20% royalty if you were right next to the Buffalo Creek over in it. Uh, I'm not saying you'll get that, but it's possible. In North Dakota, you know, you hear stories of 25% royalties. So again, it depends on where you are and the timing. An important 
thing to consider when you're reading the royalty provision in an oil and gas lease is what can the oil company deduct for costs when it's calculating the royalty. That is most important with regard to natural gas. Oil, not so much. The reason it's important with natural gas is natural gas has to be, number one, gathered and piped to a, a main pipeline. So there are compression charges, there can be dehydration charges, there can be enhancement charges. Some natural gas in Harding County is not of a high enough quality that, that they want to take it in the main pipeline until you supplement it with propane to get the BTU count up. So that's a cost. Those costs can add up, and not all, and, and leases vary widely uh, by what they say can be deducted for costs. We'll show you a, a, a lease provision here later where that comes up, and so you'll know where to look and, and see what it says. Now, just because it says you can deduct all those costs and you spot that, doesn't mean if you object, the oil and gas company is going to say, okay, we won't. We'll change that. I've seen oil and gas companies hold their ground and say, no, we are going to deduct those costs. So it's a term to negotiate, and again, there's no single right clause about what the co deductible cost should be. It's what you can negotiate. The third biggest important uh, term or provision in negotiating is the length of the primary term. Oil and gas leases have two terms. The primary term, which is the length in years that's stated in the lease, and then if production is obtained, the secondary term. The secondary term is the term that the lease is held by production. And it'll be, it's after the primary term. Uh, secondary or primary term, it used to be, like I said, that it, uh, customary that it was 10 years. Well, any more 10 years is, is beyond the lifetime in oil and gas. Uh, things are changing, drilling techniques are changing, exploration techniques are changing, and that's, and it, it's like technology. It changes even faster and faster and faster. So we started seeing a lot of five-year primary terms now, I see some three-year primary terms, and like I say on the, on the slide here, three years, you'll see five years. Uh, you'll see a three-year primary term plus three more years if the bonus is paid again. That's a fairly typical clause. So it's an option. The lessee has the option. Number one, he gets, they get the lease for three years by paying the bonus. And then at the end of that three years, if there's no production, to hold the lease. They can pay the bonus again and get another three years. And oil and gas companies like to uh, seem to have a preference for that over uh, over going with a uh, you know a, just a short three-year primary term. If they're going to go three years, they want the option to actually go six. And, and you'll get into that situation when the rancher does not want to agree to a five-year term. So then it'll revert to, well, would you agree to a three plus three? Those are just options. The secondary term is the one there where I've got the language and as long thereafter as oil or gas or whatever nature is produced. If there is production, the lease then is into the secondary term and it'll, the lease will be held so long as there is production. There can be uh, interruptions in production to shut in a well, to work over a well, or to re to, uh, to complete, uh, to do a completion in another formation, but those have to be done reasonably. And that so long as production is is uh, obtained and is, is ongoing, then the lease is held. We don't see a lot of uh, bottom and top leasing in South Dakota, but I'll tell you what it is, and because there is a clause now appearing in oil and gas leases that addresses this point. Uh, say a rancher has no, no lease at all, no oil and gas lease on his property, and then does enter into a lease with ABC Oil Company. That lease is a bottom lease. 
It's the first lease. And if you're in a really active area, and say that lease has got a term of uh, three years. If it's really in a really active area, the XYZ oil company may come in and say, tell you what, if the ABC oil company does not get production by three years, we want a lease, and then our lease will kick into effect when that bottom lease drops out. That's called top leasing. You have the bottom lease and then the top lease. And oil and gas companies don't view top leasing uh, with favor. It's kind of, in fact, it was viewed as really a dirty pool uh, a few years ago. So the bottom lease now, the bottom lessor, remedies that by putting a right of first refusal in the bottom lease. And we'll show you that clause here in a little bit. So that if a top leaser comes along and says, tell you what, if that bottom lease drops out, we'll lease, we'll lease from you now, and then our lease will be effective when the bottom lease drops out. Well, the right of first refusal says that the rancher has to go to the bottom lessor and said, I've got this offer, do you want to match it? So that's the cure for, uh, in, the, in the oil industry's opinion, the cure for top lease. There are two general types of oil and gas leases. There's a paid up lease, and then there is an annual delay rental payments lease. A paid up lease means just that. Once the bonus is paid, there, there are not going to be any further payments under that lease except royalty payments. If the oil and gas company drills its production, it will pay royalties. The other lease, the delay rental lease, is going to require a yearly payment of usually a dollar per net mineral acre per year. And the reason for that payment is if the oil and gas company doesn't drill an oil well or a gas well in the first year of the lease, then they pay the delay rental for the privilege of delaying drilling. So the the labor rental lease says, well, you need to drill in the first year unless you pay a rental for the privilege of delaying drilling. It got a little bit more money into the rancher's hands because a dollar per acre per year on a, what used to be a 10-year lease uh, was another $10 per net mineral acre. But those unless leases are, are administratively a lot tougher to administer for an oil and gas company. Because if the delay rental is not paid before the one year anniversary of the lease, then the lease terminates. And the case law is very strict on that. If the delay rental is a day late, the lease is terminated. So oil and gas companies had to be very sure to get that paid on time. Most all the leases you see now are paid up leases. The lease I'll show you here in a little bit is a paid up lease. Uh, as I say on the slide, one important thing to note under either a paid up lease or a delay rental lease, there is no obligation to drill a well. Under the paid up lease, the oil and gas company can pay the bonus, and if it's a three year lease, do nothing for three years, and there is nothing that the rancher can do about it. There's no obligation to drill. Under a delay rental lease, there's no obligation to drill. If you don't drill, if you're the oil and gas company, you need to pay the delay rental to keep the lease up. But if you don't pay the delay rental, then the lease drops out. Either case, there's no obligation to drill. Sometimes ranchers will want to try to negotiate a drilling obligation, saying, okay, I'll sign a lease with you, but you have to agree that you will drill within a certain time frame. Those are hard to get. Drilling obligations are hard to get unless you're probably in some place like the Bakken play in North Dakota. Because that's the reason oil and gas companies want the primary terms. They want the time to be able to decide where to drill, when to drill, or work it into their operations. They, they need the flexibility uh, for their business plan of when to drill. Most all oil and gas leases will 
will have a shut-in clause, the one I'll show you will have that. A shut-in clause is a clause that says that we have a well, an oil and gas well, capable of producing in commercial quantities, but it's not because we've shut it in for a, for a legitimate reason. Then, under the lease, we can pay a shut-in royalty of a dollar, usually a dollar per net mineral acre per year, for the privilege of shutting that well in, and that well will be deemed to be producing. So if we get past the primary term, the lease is still held because there is deemed to be production. A shut-in clause has a purpose, a, a good purpose for gas wells. Because if a gas well is drilled and we get gas in commercially paying quantities, you got to get that gas to the pipeline before you can sell it. And the well might be 10 or 20 miles from the pipeline. Well, that's going to take time to get that well hooked up to the pipeline. So during that time, the primary term of the lease is going to run out. The oil and gas lessee can pay a shut-in royalty hold the lease, get the well connected, and then turn the well on. So it works, it's good for everybody. It's good for the rancher, it's good for the oil and gas lessee. For oil wells, a shut-in clause doesn't have as much utility because oil is trucked out. In, in North Dakota, like in the Bakken, they may be piping some of those wells directly to a big central railroad gathering location, but usually, the well, you might have two or three wells together hooked up to a tank battery, uh, a truck, semi, a tanker will come in once a week, you know, once a month, depends on the amount of production, and load up and haul the oil out. So there's no need to hook them up to, to a pipeline. Uh, and I, I think a shutting clause for an oil well doesn't have as much utility. And, and if the oil company wants one, you need to careful about how you negotiate that clause. The amount of the shut-in royalty, I said, is usually a dollar per net mineral acre per year. Uh, I advocate putting a time limit on the period that a well can be shut in. Uh, with a gas well, even if you have to go you know, 20 miles to hook up the gas well to the gas pipeline, which is where you sell the gas into, you shouldn't be able to shut in that well for 10 years. That, that well should be hooked up within a short period of time than that. And typically what I've seen is oil and gas companies will agree to a three-year shutting period or a two-year shutting period. A uh, oil and gas lease, uh, usually the, the oil company wants to lease all of the lands owned by the rancher. So say if the rancher owns 5,000 acres, the oil and gas lease will describe all 5,000 of those acres. And if a well is drilled and there is production, then that one well will hold all 5,000 acres past the primary term. Even though the spacing unit for that well might only be 320 acres. But still, all 5,000 acres are held by just that one well. And one answer to that was, well, have, have little bitty 320 acre leases. The rancher would, you know, would have 10 or 15 of those 320 acre leases. That's a little cumbersome. So there is a clause called a pew clause, which is pretty standard which says that at the end of the primary term, if there's production, only the leased lands within that spacing unit that is producing will be held past the primary term. So 320 acres are in the spacing unit, only those 320 acres are held past the primary term, and the rancher's free to lease the other acres again. That's called a pew clause. And what I just described is what's called a horizontal pew clause. It only holds, horizontally, it only holds 320 acres in the example I gave. You can also have geological formation pew clauses or vertical pew clauses. 
which says in addition to only holding the lands that are in the spacing unit, the only formations held past the primary term are those formations that are producing in that spacing unit. So like Bob said, in Harding County, the oil producing formation is the Red River B. You could say that only the formations producing are held past the primary term, and if they're only producing from the Red River B, that's the only formation held. So then that, that'll segregate it vertically. In a wildcat area, like most of South Dakota is, uh, oil and gas companies do not agree to a vertical view clause. Uh, the reason is they don't know what formation is going to produce until they drill. And once they get a producing formation, they would like to be able to explore up and down from that formation, usually, to see if there's something else. So they aren't going to agree that they're going to lose everything except that one producing formation. That you might be able to get a vertical.